What's up guys, video information here. I apologize for not making a video of the 14th and 15th, but I'm gonna make up for it here by having 20 stocks. I had a sore throat, I'm feeling better today, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a new challenge. Not five, not 10, 20 stocks. This is number 17 of the series, Stock Market News Update for Wednesday, October 16th, 2019. We are covering Intel, Square, Tilray, Broadcom, Activision, Public Is, Google, United Health, Shopify, Apple, Nintendo, Tesla, SpaceX, Sony, Twitter, McDonald's, Qualcomm, Riot Games, or Tessin is really what I'm comparing it to because Tessin has a huge stake in Riot Games, if you didn't know. Best Buy, and lastly, Microsoft. Intel has agreed to purchase a software business from Toronto-based Pivot Technology Solutions for $27 million. The U.S. chipmaker said on Tuesday, Intel said it would buy Smart Edge, a software that helps split up data and store it closer to users to make computing devices respond faster. The software is designed to run on Intel's chips, which are best known as the heart of most personal computers, but which the company is aiming to sell into equipment for 5G, the next generation of wireless data networks that is being rolled out starting this year. According to Pivot's Sorry, according to Pivot security filing, Smart Edge did not generate significant revenue in the first 6 months of 2019, but made a loss of about 1 million before depreciation and amortization. Pivot, which has a market value of about $43 million, was issued a U.S. patent on Smart Edge's technology in July. Intel, which expects to close the Smart Edge deal in the fourth quarter, so the end of this year, views 5G as a chance to expand its sales beyond personal computers and data centers, its two largest business segments. In 5G networks, more data will be stored on computers scattered near cell towers and other network gear. Storing the data there, a practice called edge computing, and the industry is expected to help large files like videos show up more quickly on user screens than if they were stored in centralized data centers. We begin to take full advantage of our combined technologies and teams to accelerate the development of the edge computing market. Dan Rodriguez, a general manager of the network compute division in Intel's data center group, said in a statement. All right, guys, next up is Square. Square Inc. announced Thursday that it was officially opening up payment processing capabilities to sellers of CBD products after initially offering the service as part of a beta program. Speaking at an event in Manhattan Square's General Counsel Sivan Whitley highlighted an opportunity to offer modern capabilities, to offer modern processing capabilities, I apologize for that, to CBD merchants which have been seen as a thorny commercial area for business partners due to the evolving regulatory landscape in the industry. CBD sellers at the event pointed to challenges around obtaining transparent payment services mentioning high fees from other processors and a prior reliance on check payments. No more check payments. So we're going to skip that, but if you want to pause it real quick, that's what CBD is. I already kind of know. A lot of people know. So the FDA is working on a set of regulations for CBD, but not until they are ready. Sorry, but until they are ready, companies are not allowed to add it to food or drink and cannot make medical claims for topicals and other products. So if you guys don't know, Aurora Cannabis has a lot of food and drinks already lined up for when it is legalized, but who knows when that'll be. Massachusetts-based Core Leaf Holdings was sent an FDA warning letter in July for claiming CBD-based products would treat a range of serious diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. Unlike THC, the psychoactive ingredient in the cannabis plant, CBD has not been wildly researched. Square will charge CBD sellers 3.9% plus 10 cents per transaction for in-person tap, swipe, and dip payments. Online payments will cost 4.2% plus 30 cents per transaction. Sellers will also be able to access other Square business services, including payroll and inventory management offerings. The cannabis maker and brewing king will work together to produce market non-alcoholic beverages containing cannabidiol, CBD. The CBD-infused drinks will go on sale in Canada once regulations allow, and potentially as early as December, so two months. CBD is a non-psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. Unlike tetrahydrocannabinol, the psychoactive component of marijuana, CBD doesn't get people high. But thanks to its perceived health benefits, CBD is becoming increasingly popular. Analysts at market research company Brightfield Group forecast the CBD market will grow to nearly $24 billion by 2023, up from approximately $620 million in 2018. Huge growth. 
Anheuser, Bosch, and Bev and Tilray first announced a research partnership in December 2018. The company's plan to commercialize CBD infused drinks represents a significant progression for the joint venture, which is non which is now named Fluent Beverage Company. To be fluent means to have mastery of a subject or skill. Fluent CEO Jordan Socket said in a press release. We have assembled a team with the best in class expertise from the beverage and cannabis industries, and together we are researching we are reaching higher for our consumers with a shared commitment to setting the standard for product quality and responsible marketing. Fluent also intends to further its research on THC. The company would eventually like to sell THC infused beverages in addition to those that contain CBD. Europe has ordered chipmaker Broadcom to stop applying exclusivity clauses and agreements with six of its major customers, imposing so-called interim measures based on preliminary findings from an ongoing antitrust investigation. The move follows a formal statement of objections issued by the Competition Commission in June. At the time, the regulator said it would seek to order Broadcom to halt its behavior while the investigation proceeds, quotation, to avoid any risk of serious and irreparable harm to competition. Today, Broadcom has been ordered to unilliterately stop applying anti-competitive provisions in agreement with six customers and to inform them it will no longer apply such measures. It is also barred from agreeing provisions with the same or similar effect and from taking any retaliatory practices intended to punish customers with an equivalent effect. Commenting in a statement, antitrust chief Margaret Vestager said, We have strong indications that Broadcom, the world's leading supplier of chipsets used for TV set top boxes and modems, is engaging in anti competitive practices. Broadcom's behavior is likely in the absence of intervention to create serious and irreversible harm to competition. We cannot let this happen, or else European customers and consumers would face higher prices and less choice and in innovation. We therefore ordered Broadcom to immediately stop its conduct. Why are gamers protesting Blizzard? Following his win during the Asia Pacific Grandmasters broadcast on October 6, the gas mask wearing pro gamer Blitz Chung voiced a phrase used by Hong Kong protesters, liberate Hong Kong, re revolution of our age. On October 8th, Blizzard said that Blitz Chung violated the, comp the competition's official rules, resulting in his removal from the Grandmasters tournament and a 12-month ban from other events. While we stand by one's right to express individual thoughts and opinions, the statement continued, and players and other participants that elect to participate in our esports competitions must abide by the official competition rules. This statement, however, appears to be different from the official statement from the company made on the Chinese social media platform Weibo on October 8th. Multiple translations of the Chinese statement show a much harsher tone from the company. Here's IGN's translation. We express our strong indignation or resentment and condemnation of the events that occurred in the Hearthstone Asia Pacific competition last weekend and absolutely oppose the dissemination of political ideas during any events or games. The players involved will be banned and the commentators involved will be immediately terminated from any official business. Also, we will protect or safeguard our national dignity or honor. So they don't want to be used as someone to go ahead and say whatever they want, but... It does come down to freedom of speech, too. After days of silence, Blizzard President J. Allen Brack released a statement October 11th regarding Blitz Chung. He said China had no influence on our decision. Blitz Chung's ban has been reduced to six months from 12, and he'll receive his winnings from his recent tournament victory. The casters who conducted the postgame interview will also have a six-month ban. After Blizzard reconsidered its punishment... Blitz Chung released a statement via Twitter on October 12th. He said he appreciates his reduced penalty, but he now questions his future with Hearthstone. I'm grateful for Blizzard re reconsidering their position about my ban, he said. Lastly, many people want to know if I would be competing in Hearthstone in the future. Honestly, I have no idea on that. I will take this time to relax myself to decide if I am staying in the competition in the competitive Hearthstone scene or not. All right, guys, so this is Public Is. If you don't know what Public Is... Or public is group, sorry. If you don't know what public is group is, here it is right here. So just a quick look over. Obviously, this doesn't tell you everything. Do your own research. But a dividend yield percentage of 5.69%. A PE ratio of 9.62. Market cap of $2.5 and, and I mean, the price is really low. $10.40 per share. So that's that. Let's actually take a look, though. 
Public Is Group needed a big win. The French company, the third largest advertising group in the world, releasing a dismal earnings report last week. Pressured by budget cuts from clients amid competition with Facebook and Google, Public Is said it was in a painful situation. The ad giant behind marketing campaigns and media placement for corporations like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, and L'Oreal, Public Is slashed its sales forecast for the year. Its stock price sank. Arthur Sedone, the company's chief executive, sounded less than thrilled on a call with investors saying that Public Is has dug deep to understand the challenges we are facing. On Monday, Mr. Sedone sent a memo to employees. Its tone was elated. After an intense four-month pitch, he wrote, Public Is has reached a deal with one of the largest and most coveted clients in advertising, the Walt Disney Company. As part of its efforts to persuade Disney, Public Is trouted out its new subsidiary, Epsilon Data Management, which claims on its website to have information on virtually every U.S. consumer. Advertising pitches have come a long way since the 1960s. When creative teams tried to impress potential clients with snappy slogans, catchy jingles, and arresting visuals while pledging to attract the housewife segment or the businessman demograph, these days big companies look to add com look to ad companies for their data smarts as much as their marketing expertise. The agencies with the most persuasive pitches are those that have increasingly personalized data on the patterns and preferences of a broad range of consumers. Public is bought Epsilon for nearly $4 billion in July. With all that in mind, since the acquisition, Epsilon has played a role in helping Public Is land accounts with the Swiss pharmaceutical colossus Novartis and the snack behemoth Mondelez. And there's some of the things. I don't really know the first one, but this one right here, Bel Belvita, Cadbury, and Chips Ahoy I'm familiar with. Disney already has plenty of data on its customers, but the prospect of precisely targeting potential moviegoers, theme park visitors, hotel guests, and subscribers for its coming Disney Plus streaming service appealed to the company. So that's what they expect them to be able to do successfully, appeal to all of those customers. Of course, the two people familiar with the pitch process. While the Disney Public Is deal may benefit both companies, some worry that it may put consumer privacy at risk. Google has been experimenting with wearable technology for the past couple of years. In 2015, they released a new line of functional clothing that allowed users to interact with their phones through the fabric. However, due to expensive retail prices, the wearable clothing trend never caught on. Almost five years later, the company is still chasing the same goal with the release with the recent release of Levy's Jacquard enabled jackets. Back in 2017, St. Lawrence launched a backpack with Jacquard support priced at $1,000. Luxury products like these didn't get much attention from the average tech users due to the high price because you're just paying too much. That is why Google is hoping to present a new type of wearable technology that will bring the same benefits as a more affordable price. Read on to learn more about their Levy's smart jackets. We will. So the latest collaboration between Google and Levy's has brought us to two versions of the smart jackets, including the classic Levy's trucker jacket at $198 and the Sherpa trucker jacket at $248. Of course, the ladies, they got to make more expensive. Each jacket comes with Google's Jaguar dongle. That's a hilarious word. That is placed in the jacket's cuff. It connects to the conductive fabric inside the jacket and thus makes interaction possible. Once you connect a smartphone on the dongle, you can control multiple features with simple movements such as a swipe or a tap over the cuff. For instance, tapping and holding over the cuff of the jacket will allow you to issue commands to the connected smartphone. That's pretty cool. Users can also customize each movement or gesture to activate different features and abilities, including communicating with the voice assistant, controlling music, or controlling the phone's camera. The tech-enabled jackets currently feature 19 abilities, that's a lot of abilities, that can be customized on the phone. The dongle also sends notifications through, vibra through vibration to let you know about your messages, emails, and alarms. So, will wearable technology catch on? After it has failed to earn the interest of the masses, wearable technology is making a breakthrough once again. The question is, will it catch on this time? Experts at Google are hoping that the tech-enabled jackets will become a true thanks to their move will become a true thanks to their more uh, affordable price point. They didn't finish it though. Jackets will become a true <laughs> thanks to their more affordable price point. All right, we're going to end it there. Next article. United Health Group handily beat the street's third quarter projections, boasting 
$5 billion in profit for the quarter driven in part by the continued strong performance of its Optum subsidiary. United Health reported $60.4 billion in revenues for the quarter, a year-over-year increase of 7% or $3.8 billion. The healthcare giant posted a 5.9% margin for the quarter. Year-over-year earnings were up $4.6 billion in the third quarter of 2018. Optum and United Healthcare are driving value for our customers, creating momentum to finish the year strongly and move into 2020 with an intense focus on accelerating the growth of our businesses by advancing quality, affordability, and satisfaction for those we serve, said David Wichman, CEO of United Health Group in the earnings release. Optum posted double-digit growth in both revenue and earnings for the quarter, United Health announced. The company, which offers a diverse array of services, including pharmacy, benefit management, and provider services, saw its revenue increase by 13% year over year to $28.8 billion, and earnings increased, guys, by 16% year over year to $2.4 billion. That's a margin of 8%, you United Health Group said. Optum Health, which houses the company's provider services, saw a 34% increase in revenue for the quarter. United Healthcare has added an additional 415,000 members so far this year, according to the release. United Health's insurance arm posted $48.1 billion in revenue and earnings of $2.7 billion for the quarter. Re- revenue from United Healthcare's Medicare Advantage plans was up by 10% in the quarter, growing by $1.2 billion, by far the largest increase among the issuers, the insurers' business lines. All right, guys. So for the Shopify article, fair warning, he's pretty funny. So I may laugh a little bit. I'm going to try not to, though. Here's an exercise for you. How much would you pay for $100 million per year of operating cash flow and maybe $1.4 billion in sales, growing at about 20% per year? Would you pay 10 times that revenue, maybe 20 times that revenue? Certainly, you wouldn't pay 30 times that revenue, but that's almost precisely what investors are being asked to pay today for stock in Shopify, the Canadian e-commerce software house. Shopify's market cap is $39.8 billion, about 29.5 times its estimated 2019 revenue, based on the $680 million that came in for the first two quarters. Please, let's not talk about earnings. There aren't any. So without any earnings, why the insane valuation? It's because of one magic word. The magic word is Amazon. Shopify is said to be competing directly with Amazon. How does a Canadian company with $380 million in sales for its most recent quarter compete with an e-commerce and cloud giant that earned $2.6 billion on revenue of $63.4 billion in its, recent, in its most recent quarter? Here's how The Observer put it last month. Shopify overtakes eBay as second biggest shopping site after Amazon. How exactly has Shopify overtaken eBay? The Financial Times notes that Shopify's market cap is now bigger than that of eBay. The market cap of eBay is $32.5 billion. But does this make Shopify bigger than eBay? It doesn't. Revenue for eBay in the second quarter was $2.7 billion. That's seven times more than Shopify brought in. Also, eBay had earnings of $403 million in its second quarter or $0.46 cents per share. So 0.46 if you were to look at EPS on Robinhood. Is shop stock a bargain? What's even crazier is that we're supposed to consider Shopify a bargain now because the shares recently pulled back from their all-time high of $406 achieved in late August. This came after it priced a secondary offering of a stock at $317.60 to help strengthen its balance sheet. Shopify needed Shopify needs to strengthen the balance sheet to pay $450 million for six river systems, which makes robotic carts for warehouses. This will be added to the Shopify Fulfillment Network, announced in June, which mainly consists of a web page and a lot of promises. Six River Systems had just gone through a 25 million Series B funding round. The robots, a dubbed Chuck, are the size of a big shopping cart and lead workers around the warehouse rather than following them. That's interesting. They lead workers, so they tell them where to go. That's awesome. You don't have to believe me. I admit to being in the minority of investor place con- contributors in my suspicions about Shopify. And Cooper recently called it a strong buy. David Modell recently called this the best time to buy. What about my track record? I've been calling Shopify a bubble stock for almost two years since it was trading in the mid $70 range. In June, I called the shares my favorite mistake, claiming it was rising on a short squeeze. At the time, 28% of its shares were being held by shorts. The most recent percentage, according to Fintel, is 31%. By way of comparison, Tesla has a short interest of 20%. All right, next stock.
All right, guys, so now we're on Apple. Time and time again at every one keynote and presentation, Tim Cook and his team at Apple stress how they support their customers and how customers drive everything they do. And that's why everyone works so hard to give them the best experience possible. It's a shame that the recent sledgehammer of the Mac OS Catalina has severed that bond of trust for many users. Mac OS Catalina has brought many welcome changes to the Mac platform. It brings a renewed focus with three new media apps to manage music, video, and podcasts to the platform. It allows iOS devices to be used as second screens, and it brings with it the ability to run the latest iPad apps on your Mac OS machine. And Apple is right to push forward with these plans. Apple is right to accommodate the new world of online services and changing usage patterns. But is Apple right to focus only on the brave new world and push it draconian attitude to older applications in the old ways by removing support? While the removal of iTunes is balanced for many by the inclusion of the new Apple Music, Apple TV and Apple Podcasts apps, Apple has removed key elements of the underlying code, which has rendered many music applications for working creatives useless. Promised XML support in the new apps was never delivered. Some developers are struggling to update their apps in time. Others look at the cost slash benefit and decide that it is cheaper to stop development. And in some cases, developers are no longer able to maintain code and users are reliant on Apple being a good and responsible community manager to maintain code support. All right, guys, so this is more of a fun article, but this is Nintendo. So the seven Nintendo Switch games you need to own. I'm not really going to read the descriptions. I'll just kind of name them. Bre okay. Breathe of the Wild. You got to play Breathe of the Wild, guys. It's an amazing game. Game of the Decade is what these guys are calling it. Mario Odyssey. You know you want to play Mario Odyssey. You've got the Zelda game. Congrats. Step two, buy the Mario game. Next up, we got Hollow Knight. I like the how they put it in the description, though, so I, I, I will read this part. I'll probably take you around 20 plus hours to finish the single player quest. Secondly, Hollow Knight is sublime. Hollow Knight takes the best of Super Metroid and the best of Dark Souls and sort of smushes them together to make something fresh and unique. But that's just part of its charm. Hollow Knight is dripping in atmosphere and glazed in a dark nostalgia. Check out that game. Number four, another Mario game. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Look, Mario Kart 8 isn't technically a new game. The original Mario Kart 8 was released on the Nintendo Wii U. This is just an update of that game. But what an update. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is absolutely the definitive Mario Kart game. It features all the tracks from the original game, including all the downloadable content. Same goes for the additional characters, racers. The back of the box quote for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is biggest Mario Kart ever. But it's true. It is absolutely loaded with content. Best of all, it's good content. And lastly, Into the Breach. Well, actually, there's two more games after this. Sorry. Into the Breach. Into the Breach, like Hollow Knight, is available on other platforms, but best owned on the Switch. It's not a visually intensive game. It wouldn't benefit from a slicker frame rate or more detailed textures. It simply is what it is, and it's fantastic. It's a simple strategy game on the surface. So check it out. It's not true. It's more than that. Dead Cells. Count Dead Cells alongside Hollow Knight and Into the Breach as indie games that make the most sense on Nintendo Switch. It's tough to explain what Dead Cells is without indulging in the worst type of video game jargon. Alright guys, lastly is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. There's no really explanation with that one. Super Smash Bros. is the same thing every time, just more characters. So yeah, that's what they think you guys should get. Alright guys, next up is Tesla. A fleet of 40 Tesla Model 3 vehicles are being deployed in Madison, Wisconsin to create an all-electric taxi service. Green Cab Madison, which currently operates a taxi fleet consisting of 40 total Prius, partnered with Zeroology to go all-electric instead of hybrids. They decided to go with the Tesla Model 3. Zeroology set out about the move. With the new all-electric vehicles, we can save 8.5 metric tons of carbon per year per car. Jody Schimmett. Co-founder and president of Green Cab added, it's an investment in the community. While all electric vehicles indeed offer direct benefits to the environment by eliminating local air pollution, it's not only for the community. It can also be a very financially beneficial decision when accounting for gas savings since taxi and ride-sharing vehicles see a lot of mileage. They can also save on maintenance. 
Green Cab Madison expects that it will completely convert its fleet of 40 vehicles to the Model 3 by the end of the month. That's pretty quick. As previously stated, Tesla's vehicles are becoming particularly popular with taxis in the Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway, and are starting to get there in America too with fleets like Columbus Yellow Cabs. We previously reported on the very first Tesla taxi driver in North America when his Model S hit 100,000 miles back in 2017. The best example of a Tesla taxi fleet is in Amsterdam, where they have been operating a fleet of over 100 Tesla taxis for years and even updated their fleet with Model X SUVs last year. Man, guys, this is a hugely growing thing. All right. Well, I remember when financial education was talking about this, so this makes sense. The SpaceX Starlink constellation may end up almost four times bigger than what the company originally planned. According to Space News, that's awesome, Space News. The company has asked the International Telecommunication Union for permission to access Spectrum for 30,000 more Starlink satellites. When SpaceX first launched the project, it introduced Starlink as a space-based internal network comprised of 12,000 satellites. The ITU and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission already approved the company's request for Spectrum access for those 12,000. This new batch of requests is for an additional 30,000 units. The FCC submitted a total of 20 filings to the ITU, with each one asking permission for 1,500 satellites in various low Earth orbits. The company wants to place them in orbits between 204 and 360 miles in altitude, which MIT's technology review notes could be a cause for concern. That's interesting. Aerospace Corporation's Roger Thompson told the publication that while the area of space is cleanest, it's also where we tend to fly crewed spacecraft, including the ISS. He said flooding the area with thousands of satellites will have an impact on future human spaceflight. That said, asking for permission for 30,000 satellites doesn't mean the Starlink project will actually launch a total of 42,000. Some of the company's critics believe that the filings are just playing a ploy to drown the ITU in studies now that it's on the verge of changing its rules. <laughs> so it's just a, it's just like a distraction tactic. That's awesome. Whether that's true or not, filing with the ITU is just the first step in a very long process. SpaceX has seven years to launch a satellite with the frequencies it requested, and it will have to operate it for 90 days before it loses access to the spectrum rights. The company successfully launched the first 60 Starlink satellites into orbit earlier this year, with plans of launching 60 more within the month and even more in November. All right, guys, next up is Sony. Sony has announced that its new 360 reality audio technology will launch in late fall with several partners the format involves object-based spatial audio that places various elements of a music track around the listener in a virtual spherical environment the experience is designed to replicate live music with instruments and vocals coming from different directions at launch there will be around a thousand songs available in 360 reality audio including tracks from artists like pharrell williams bob dylan so on and so forth but the company says it's also working with Universal, Warner, and Live Nation to add more content. 360 Real Reality Audio is a proof point that innovation never stops, Sony Electronics President and COOO Michael Fazzullo said in a press statement. The confluence of deep technical roots, tireless artists, and forward-thinking hardware and semiconductor partners illustrates the tremendous draw of this radical new way to make music even more moving. Together with valued industry partners, Sony has architected the most powerful, realistic music experience for listeners and a new medium for artists to create. As for how you'll actually get to listen to 360 Reality Audio, Sony has partnered with Amazon Music, HD, Deezer, Tidal, and Nugs.net. That's bad news for Spotify or Apple Music users. Then, but Sony does call out Amazon's promising new Echo Studio as a way to play back this music natively. Other speakers will require Sony's 360 Reality Audio decoder along with multiple speaker units and signal processing technology. So it's unlikely that this will work for many existing setups. However, at launch, the only mobile app support will come through headphones from most manufacturers when used with the Tidal, Deezer, and Nugs.net iOS and Android apps. Certain recent Sony headphones will also be able to produce a custom immersive musical feel. That's cool. Through the Headphones Connect app, although it's not clear how exactly they'll work with external content. All right, guys, next article. The social media platform sought to clarify its rules for politicians Tuesday after coming under pressure from Senator Kamala Harris as Democratic 
presidential candidate to suspend President Donald Trump's account. We want to make it clear today that the accounts of world leaders are not above our policies entirely, Twitter said in a blog post, adding that part of its mission is to allow people to engage their leaders directly. Twitter said it was sticking to a policy first laid out in June. Under those rules, tweets by world leaders that violate the platform's policies will stay online if they have a clear public interest value. In some cases, Twitter will place the tweet behind a note that provides context. It said direct interactions with fellow public figures, comments on on political issues of the day, or foreign policy saber-rattling on economic or military issues are generally not in violation of the rules. Yet the company has drawn some red lines that apply even to world leaders. It will take action if tweets promote terrorism, include private information or intimate photos, engage in child sexual exploration, or promote self-harm. Twitter will also act when direct threats of violence are made against an individual. However, it's said that context matters and that interactions between public figures would likely not qualify. We, we recognize that we're operating at an increasing complex and polarizing political culture. The blog post said, these are constantly evolving challenges and will keep our policies and approach under at, uh, under advisements. Ah, those political words, man, they get me. All right, so the Trump tweets, if you guys want to read that, feel free, but we're going to move on. Tensions between McDonald's and many of its U.S. franchisees appear to have reemerged in recent weeks amid a dispute over what operators say is corporate pressure aimed at diminishing support for its newly created franchise association. In July, McDonald's told suppliers that the National Owners Association, NOA, was not a sanctioned franchise organization. Several sources told Restaurant Business the company has some internal groups designed to represent franchisees' interests. A number of suppliers ultimately decided not to attend the meeting as a result of company comments, several sources said. It referred to internal groups, including the National Franchisee Leadership Alliance and groups that oversee supply chains and advertising. It also referred to affiliated diversity groups of owners. The company said that costs associated with NOA memberships, sponsorships, and booth fees are not to be passed along in the cost of goods sold to McDonald's distributors and ultimately to McDonald's restaurants. A company representative said that the letter was sent to alleviate confusion among suppliers regarding the status of the association and whether they should attend, but operators believe the company is putting pressure on suppliers to keep them from supporting the association. That could be viewed as an effort to delegitimize the franchise association. More practically, the withdrawal of supplier attendance or sponsorship could hurt the association financially. Accountants, suppliers, lenders, and other companies will attend meetings to build relationships with the franchisees, and their support can help fund the group's activities. While a representative indicated that nothing about the company's view of the association has changed, the letter has intensified tension between the company and the operators who form the group. McDonald's has traditionally had a cooperative relationship with its franchisees, more so than most other franchise brands but it also has a history of pushing back against the formation of independent associations. NOA's creation last year was seen as something of a historic moment for the chain and its relationship with operators. McDonald's relies heavily on franchisees who operate 95% of the chain's almost 14,000 domestic locations. The association is the first broad-based independent association in the company's history. Tensions had eased in the months since then. McDonald's appeared to make nice with the group and made a number of concessions to address franchisees' concerns. For instance, it gave them two years to remodel restaurants under its experience of the future design and renegotiated its delivery deal with Uber Eats, bringing down the commission rates paid on delivery orders and ending the exclusive arrangement. The moves appear to have improved relations between the company and franchisees. Interest in the association has only grown in recent months, and sources said membership was up. The group has met four times, including the initial meeting that led to its formation. So it's all good now. Next article. All right, guys, Qualcomm. I know you guys all wanted to hear about Qualcomm. 5G, baby. Qualcomm unveiled partnerships with over 30 original equipment manufacturers that plan to launch 5G Wireless Access, or FWA, equipment next year, according to a company press release. The list of partners include industry giants such as Samsung, Sharp, 
Panasonic, and Nokia. The 5G FWA equipment will leverage Qualcomm Snapdragon X55 5G modem RF system reference architecture and enable carriers to offer home and, and enterprise internet service using 5G networks. The extensive list of suppliers working with Qualcomm points to significant demand from telecoms to roll out expensive or sorry, to roll out expansive FWA solutions in 2020. Qualcomm designed the reference architecture to be compatible with virtually any combination of 5G spectrum and modes, which means telecom should be able to add the FWA hardware to their existing 5G network infrastructure. Telecoms are poised to invest $1 trillion globally in 5G networks between 2018 and 2025, with much of the investment backloaded, according to a 2019 GSMA intelligence report. FWA hardware will be in high demand because it is a relatively low-cost add-on to 5G network investments that creates a revenue stream beyond mobile service. FWA enables 5G to be transmitted to a modem, which can then send a high-speed, low-latency connection through Wi-Fi. As an alternative to broadband, 5G FWA promises to shift the competitive landscape for telecoms, creating an opportunity to streamline operational costs because because 5G FWA shares the same cell network as 5G mobile services. It enables telecoms operating in both internet and mobile services to streamline operational costs. By 2024, an estimated 10% of U.S. households will rely on on 5G FWA, chipping away at the 80% share of households that rely on broadband today. Mobile operators can use 5G FWA to disrupt the internet market by leveraging their streamlined operations to outprice providers maintaining both broadband and, and 5G networks. All right, next article. Riot Games. All right, guys, so Riot Games, again, testing as a big stake in this i'm not sure how large they either own it completely or they have a larger than 40 percent stake but anyways let's get into this riot games has generated billions of dollars over the past 10 years and in the process created a highly influential globe spanning esports league all of this success revolved around a single video game league of legends that is about to change to a degree. The Los Angeles-based company announced Tuesday a slate of new games, many of which are scheduled to be released next year. The new game titles will be in addition to an animated series based on League of Legends and a documentary Riot financed about the origins of the game, which debuted on Netflix tonight. So that was yesterday. All of the new games, except for one, are set in the League of Legends universe and will feature that game's characters or champions as they're better known to league players. The new titles include a card game, a fighting game, multiplayer, online battle arena game, open world game, and an esports simulator, seemingly akin to the football manager franchise. That's pretty cool. The non-league based title is codenamed Project A and is being described as a tactical shooter game that will be set on Earth. And I guess that's an um, example of it, or a quick little demo trailer. If it and there's a quick little demo of it. New games from Riot have been wildly expected by its fans and industry observers for many years, even as the company's 10-year-old flagship title still sees a peak of about 8 million concurrent players daily, according to a September announcement from the company. We have the benefit of being able to be long-term. Mark Morell, co-founder of the Riot Games, said to the Washington Post, we don't have to go push out a product to meet some quarterly deadline or revenue target or whatnot. Riot is owned by Tessent. Okay, yeah, so it's completely owned by Tessent, a Chinese technology and entertainment conglomerate. Merrill said that the long gap before Riot's new offerings has been due to a confluence of factors, including a constant evaluation process in light of ongoing development in the rapidly evolving video game industry. He brought up Hearthstone, a massively popular card game based on Activision Blizzard's Warcraft series, as a reason his team re-evaluated Riot's card game offering, which Merrill said has been in the works for eight years and has gone through multiple starts and stops. We had to adjust how we were doing things, Merrill said. All right, feel free to read that article, but we only got two left and I'm ready to freaking end this video. Best Buy is pitching advertisers on its first party data and its high net worth customers. While the platform known as Best Buy Media Network has existed for the last four years, media agency 
say that the company has re recently been more active in pitching its offering to advertisers. The team looks to have 17 members, according to LinkedIn. The team pitches advertisers not only on its ability to target specific audiences based on their passions, gaming, or film, but its potential to predict consumer behavior based on its data, according to its website. The company is looking to differentiate its offering and compete with Amazon in a crowded marketplace by not only giving advertisers a way to connect purchase and advertising data, but to give them further insights to help them tailor their advertising around specific audience groups and passion points. The retailer is also adding a member to its internal team to help continue the rapid growth of the Best Buy Media Network, according to the job listing. The Best Buy Media Network website states that the client base for the platform is growing 50% year over year, though it doesn't attribute that percentage to any hard numbers or detail from when to when that 50% growth number is based on. Advertisers can choose from a variety of ad units, including native app units, targeted banner ads, shopper funnel emails, higher impact takeovers, dynamic creative and in-store video, which uses the TVs and computers within the Best Buy retail locations. The company also offers search, which is run through Critio, but the company's internal team handles the other ad units. It's unclear what the company's CPM rates are as multiple buyers did not have them readily available. Best Buy did not respond to multiple requests for comment. Like a number of retailers, Best Buy is playing catch up to Amazon as Amazon advertising continues to grow and mature. To do that, Best Buy is pitching advertisers on its first party data as well as its reach and scale with 1.5 billion customer interactions annually, 2 million daily web visitors. That number shoots up to 20 million daily during the holidays. Wow as well as a stat that 70% of the U.S. population lives within 15 minutes of one of the company's retail locations, according to the company's data available on its media network website. Best Buy is also touting its customer base of high net worth individuals. 40% of Best Buy customers have, have an annual household income of more than 100000 In 2019, Best Buy's total revenue was $42.9 billion. It's unclear how much of that its advertising business represents, as the company doesn't break out the revenue from its media network within its SEC filings. As is the case with Amazon, the ability to marry transaction data and with advertising data makes Best Buy attractive to advertisers. At the same time, the appeal of first-party data from retail media networks like Best Buy will likely continue to grow as Google and Apple make online tracking harder and regulations like GDPR and the upcoming CCPA continue to affect the market. One more article, guys. Last up, guys, we have Microsoft. So, why the government is investigating Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook for antitrust, but not Microsoft. Microsoft is trying to crush Slack and Zoom by essentially giving away Teams for free. The companies making the software many office workers depend on are at war with each other, and while battles over workplace communication software may sound mundane, they reflect a larger, more pressing debate about U.S. antitrust laws and how they should be applied to tech companies. Over the past year, big tech has faced a regulatory reckoning of sorts. Local and federal regulators in the U.S. are investigating some of the biggest tech companies in the world, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, for anti-competitive behavior. Notably absent from this list is the biggest tech company, Microsoft, which previously spent about a decade in antitrust regulatory crosshairs. Microsoft is in fact currently waging a potentially unfair campaign to crush two of its smaller competitors in the workplace communication software industry, Slack and Zoom. But regulators aren't focusing on it because they have more serious tech antitrust issues to deal with, like Facebook possibly facilitating the destruction of American democracy. Slack, founded in 2013, makes office chat software that's beloved by the media and tech industry. Zoom, also launched in 2013, is touted as the best video conferencing software out there. Both offer services necessary to the modern workplace, and Microsoft is aiming to beat them with the team's software it debuted in 2017, which combines Slack's and Zoom's chat, file sharing, and video conference filings, and video conference features, sorry, into one product, crucially for companies that already subscribe to Microsoft's ubiquitous Office 365 suite for staples like Excel, Word, OneDrive. Teams is essentially free meaning it's less likely they would shell out additional money to pay for access to Slack or Zoom because they're already getting it for free. 
Still, Zoom and Slack are growing at breakneck speeds, even among coveted enterprise customers. Zoom had 466 companies spending $100,000 annually as of the end of the second quarter, more than double the same period a year earlier. In the same quarter, Slack reached 720 organizations spending $100,000 a year. I guess 100000 is the number, up 75% year over year. For now, more than 77% of customers with Office 365 also had subscriptions to so-called best-of-breed apps like Slack and Zoom, a number that has been ticked up according to data from Okta, a secure login company. But there's early data showing that growth might be in jeopardy as we approach a potential recession and the economic uncertainty that comes with an election year. Overall, IT spending is expected to slow down as the year's end approaches, according to the latest survey data of company software decision makers by market researchers firm ETR. The study found that adoption of new network is slowing to pre-2018 levels and that redundancy is coming to an end, which could apply to companies that pay for both Office 365 and Slack or Zoom. Already Teams market shares trounces that of the older Zoom and Slack with 60% of businesses of all sizes saying they use or plan to use Teams this quarter. That's crazy. Additionally, some 11% of companies said they plan to decrease spending on Slack. Just 3% say they are reducing spending on Zoom and 2% on Teams. So people really like Zoom, clearly. The findings were similar among small and big companies alike. Whenever a company goes into a keep the lights on environment that will always benefit mega vendors who bundle and give away software for free, Thomas Del Vecchio, founder and chief executive officer of ETR parent company, AppTV, told Recode. That's a lot of different companies in three sentences. Anytime there's concern about a recession, the Fortune 500 is going to slow down IT spend. What he's saying is that if, is that if and when there's a downturn in the economy, Microsoft is positioned to dominate. Of course. Anyways, though, guys, that is it. Feel free to keep reading on. But that is it for me. I did 20 articles here. You're welcome. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to smash that like button and subscribe as always. I will see you guys in the next video. Video information out.